Culture, a, a media commentator, an author, producer, consultant, fashion icon, scholar, and dear friend, my brother, Mr. Todd Boy. How are you doing, man? I'm good. How are you, sir? I'm doing good, man. Um, you know, it's it's interesting because every year I feel like the black psyche starts to change. People start to have new ideas. People start to realize things that they they never really realized before. And you know, I always say it's it's very important to have a point of view, you know, because an, an open point of view is how we find the truth, how we seek the truth. And with history, the same point of view is repeated, and repetition is persuasive. We can't present the same ideas over and over. And you are always given the brand new vantage point on any anything regarding <laughs> blackness Thank so you. welcome to the podcast man how are you i'm good man i'm good appreciate the uh appreciate the kind words for sure no of course uh if if you guys don't know todd boyd or the notorious phd he is the illest most educated brother you will ever meet you know <laughs> it's it's like one of them dudes that makes it cool to be smart, you know? <laughs> so okay. I'm a, I, I wanna just dive right in with you, man. Um, okay, okay. Uh, and I wanna start by asking, you know, what kind of responsibility do we bear as a culture when it comes to the portrayal of blackness in America? I mean, that's, you know, that's a question that uh, really, um, speaks to uh, history, but it also speaks to contemporary society as well. I mean, in terms of history, um, if you talk about black culture, music, film, sports, fashion, style, you know, literature, I mean, anything cultural, um, you know, black people have used culture as a way to really define themselves in American society. And so over time, you know, that's been everything from, you know, gospel or blues, jazz music, hip hop, you know, up to the present, um, you know, in film and television, um, just across the board. I mean, when you think about American culture, you can't really have a serious conversation about the culture unless you talk about the role that black people have played and continue to play. I mean, I, I often say to people, you know, if you think about the percentage of the population that's black, um, it's actually not that large percentage wise. Um, but if you think about the cultural impact, it's massive. And so the cultural impact is so um, significant that it, I think makes people feel like the population of black people in America is bigger than it really is. Yeah. Um, I mean, you know, if you've traveled through the country, there are a lot of places in this country where there are no black people. Exactly. Um, you know, but any of those places um, you go to, um, you're going to find some example of black culture. It may be on the radio. It might just be a song or two. Uh, but it's going to be there. Well, it's it's interesting. If you travel the country, you will find a very small black population, comparatively. And if we go back to minstrelsy, if we go back to blackface, it's one of the reasons why whites wanted to pay to come get insight to see what this new culture is. Because historically, before there was radio, before there was television, people 
got a glimpse into black culture by being an enslaver and or being a friend of an enslaver and you go over to their house and they're like, hey, check out, check out my Negroes. You got to see them dance and do this uh, shuck and jive. You got to check this out. This is incredible. This is they, how... They didn't say Negro, though. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they didn't say Negro. <laughs> but, but this is how... This is how culture was disseminated at a time. And then Blacks, their first real jump into entertainment, their first real shot at making money was to create, or let me rephrase, to perform as caricatures of themselves. So before we even get deep into that, because I know you know where I'm going, right. I want to go a little bit before that, you know. So, you know, the framers, for the framers, the decision to give enhanced political power to the slaveocracy was based on a common view held by whites that Africans were inferior to European whites, a eugenic concept. How did the black films from the 20s to present embrace and or refute this proposition of infer inferiority? Well, um, you know, uh, when you control everything, you can write the rules. And so um, you can create a society in which you say black people are inferior. And then if you have the power um, you can enforce that. Um, I was watching uh, this this documentary on Netflix, Who Killed Malcolm X, uh, recently. Um, I've watched it a few times, and there's uh, one of the individuals uh, involved in this says something really interesting at the beginning of the documentary. He goes, um, you're guilty. He says, why are you guilty? because the white man said you're guilty and he has a gun. It'd be one thing for him to say you're guilty, but it's the gun that makes all the difference because with that gun, doesn't make any difference if he's telling the truth or not. It's interesting. Uh, you, you know, I, you know, I was a law professor and, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, in my studies of law, it was very interesting to see what the rule of law really means. Because the rule of law is made by the person that is in control. Right. The rule of law is made by the person in control that wants to control other people. Right. So it's interesting how you analyze, or let me rephrase, how people analyze black culture or just people of color. And they see blacks, they see Latinos, you know, in prison at a at, at a high rate, but they don't take in consideration the insurmountable handicaps that place us there. And the rule of law is one of those. And, right. you know, for centuries, we've been tasked with the, the duty of really being ideological critics or decoders, people with the responsibility of critiquing the context of sectarian rhetoric in order to really expose the dominant ideology that is really being expressed and also the ideologies that are being muted within. So if we look back in time and we even look at presidents within the last 50 years, from, from a Nixon to a Reagan or a Trump, you know, it's interesting how they use their platforms to ferment hate against our community. They use the concept of rule of law to right. establish that we are eugenically inferior. So right. to you, how did you see these presidents and, and, and our society subjugate us in all forms? Well, you know, it, it kind of goes back to what I was saying about when you are in power, you get to write the rules. And so, you know, we have to pay attention to rhetoric. We have to pay attention to language. We have to pay attention to what people say um, and what their words mean. So let's start with, with Nixon. In the 1960s, um, you know, Lyndon Johnson, after he signed um, 
the Civil Rights Act and the Voting Rights Act in 1964 and 65. Um, at one point, um, he is said to have mentioned to someone that by doing this, he lost the South. Uh, the Democratic Party lost the South for a generation. Um, he was perhaps a bit too optimistic uh, because that statement is from the mid 60s. <laughs> uh, the Democratic Party and the Republican Party is very different now than it was when he made that statement. Absolutely. But the point is, when Johnson, you know, uh, who had been very hostile uh, when he was a senator towards civil rights, he changed when he became president after the Kennedy assassination. He signed those two uh, hugely important um, acts. And Southern Democrats, you know, who were segregationist and racist um, white supremacists, um, began leaving the Democratic Party in droves. Hold on, let's just pause just for a second. Just for the listeners, you got to look at the Democrats and Republicans as exactly, like at that time, it was opposite of what we have now. So if you look at somebody as a Democrat now, imagine back then they were Republican. Okay, let's go back in. Exactly, yeah. exactly. So um, all these Southern Democrats, you know, who believed in segregation, um, all of a sudden now their party has shifted. A Southerner, Lyndon Johnson's from Texas, signs these acts. He recognizes what has happened because he used to be part of these people who are now opposed to him. And what Nixon realizes in 68 is that, you know, these racists are still out there and they're still eligible to vote. They used to be Democrats. Why don't we appeal to them? Why don't we, you know, make our pitch to them? Let's see if we can get their vote. And so over time, what you saw was these Southern conservatives go um, to the Republican Party. It started with Nixon. By the time Reagan comes along in 1980, um, you know, it goes even further. You start hearing people talk about Reagan Democrats. And really, by the 90s, I think the transition is um, fairly complete. Um, you know, you have to realize that prior to the 60s, black people in the South couldn't vote. So the Democratic Party in the South was an all white party. Well, over time, you saw Democrats vote. You saw black people vote Democratic because of Johnson signing, um, you know, those two acts. And the Democratic Party, if you look at it now, is the diverse party of yeah. the two. Right. Um, the kind of moderate Republicans that would have been in support of the civil rights legislation back in the 60s, they don't really exist much anymore. And so the Democratic Party and now with Trump, um, I mean, the Republicans have just gone full racist, um, yeah. full white supremacist. Yeah. Um, you know, they have dispensed with the notion of um, having moderate Republicans. I don't think they really exist. There's a handful of them. Right. Uh, Mitt Romney's not really moderate. He's conservative. He's just, you know, not as conservative as Trump. Right. Um, and he doesn't embrace the sort of racial politics that Trump embraced. But he's a conservative Republican. Like, you know, he's not some like moderate person. He's just moderate, relatively speaking. So I think you have to look at these changes. This is over a 60 year period of time. I remember my mother telling me a story uh, when I was young about how there was this big fight, you know, in her house. Uh, her mother and father, my grandparents, got into an argument because um, my grandmother was a Republican. And, you know, my grandmother, I mean, I don't even know what year she was born. She died in her 90s. So she might have been born in the early 1900s or the late 1800s. Right. And she my mother's from Indiana. My grandmother was a was a Republican because Republicans were associated right. more so with uh, civil rights because of Abraham Lincoln. Right. And my mother told me this story about how my grandfather decided during the time of uh um, uh, Franklin Roosevelt that he was going to vote Democratic. Mm. 
And she said there was this huge debate, you know, between my grandmother and my grandfather, because my grandmother's like, why are you voting for the party of the segregationists? And he was saying, well, things are going to change. And so, you know, you can't really look at what's going on now and think it's been that way all along because it hadn't. There's a long history to it, and that's that's part of it. Well, part of this new consciousness that we have also is kind of creating our own revisionist history. I love this, I love this phrase, this revisionist history, right? Because what we're seeking to do is actually revise uh, history. We're trying to vitiate this educational sterilization that we've grown up with. Um, we've grown up in a way where we're supposed to thank Abraham Lincoln for what he did for us, right? <laughs> <laughs> you know what I'm saying? We're supposed to thank him for what he right. did for us. There's the a sta- yes, there's a statue of Abraham Lincoln looking down at an enslaved or a newly freed black man, right? But this is part of that educational sterilization. This is something that symbolizes the concept of pre-slavery, or let me rephrase, the the journey from pre-slavery to pre-equality. We're still not there yet. We're still not there yet. And right. with these leaders, they purport this deferred commitment where they recognize a past injustice, but there's a delay in service. And, you know, I always tell people to read books. Go into the 70s, go into the 60s, go into the 50s, read black books from back then. Right. And look at what they said about presidents. Look at, you know, like this is this was a time, you know, in the, in the last century is a time where our consciousness was on a whole new level because we were actually allowed to read by law. You know, right. <laughs> we, yeah. we were disseminating new kinds of information. And just like you said at the beginning of this conversation, the leaders say what the rules should be, right? They write the rules. <laughs> they write the rules. And then people write rules to benefit themselves. Absolutely. They, they don't write rules yeah. to penalize themselves. They write right. rules to benefit themselves. Right. So the key is being in a position of power where you are able to create the rules and those rules you create are going to penalize certain people and benefit other people. And yes. that's been the case all along. And so Unless that changes, then you might see some variations over time, but the bigger picture is going to be one that's going to remain the same because you have the same people in position of power and they're writing things to their benefit. The ideology of of America is from the standpoint of us being a slave society, not a society that had slaves, right? Well. You know, that's a good point. And and what I would say, you know, in addition, which is kind of a, 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 a remix on that, America does not define itself as a nation of slaves. Have you ever heard anybody say this is a nation of slaves? I've never heard that. <laughs> yeah. You have, however, heard people say, what? This is a nation of immigrants. Yeah. You have heard that. Yeah, yeah. yes, yes. <laughs> but there are two groups of people in this country who are not immigrants. Yes. Black people who are yes. descendants of slaves. Yes. And Native Americans. Right. My grandfather is Native American. Mm. My family obviously is black and descendants of slaves. Mm-hmm. So honestly, I wish a motherfucker would come to me. <laughs> about what it means to be American because as far as I'm concerned, there ain't nobody more American in this country. Absolutely, man. I mean, if you want to talk about what it means to be American, but the thing is, if you are a descendant of slaves, if you are a descendant of the people whose land was taken from them, the Native Americans, who we often uh, leave out of the equation, who should be included, they were here before anybody. 
They, right? Yeah. And and Africans was here before the Europeans. They they came before Columbus. I haven't been certified. Absolutely. Right? Absolutely. Okay. So take all that. But then you have this group of European immigrants and later immigrants from all over the world. But we're talking about European immigrants coming to America. If this is a nation of immigrants, where do descendants of slaves fit? Because that immigrant narrative doesn't apply to black people. Give you an example. And this is deep. People don't think about this. 2004, a cat by the name of Barack Hussein Obama Mm -hmm. gives a famous speech at the Democratic National Convention. Incredible speech. Uh, put him on the national political map. Four years later, he was elected president of the United States. However, four years before that, that same guy, Barack Obama, came to L.A. to go to the Democratic Convention at the Staples Center. He had no juice at all. He couldn't get in any of the parties. His American Express card got turned down at the airport Incredible transformation, right? <laughs> yes, yes. That happened in 2000. 2004, he gives that speech. 2008, he's the president. Yeah. That is maybe the greatest come up in American history. I don't know <laughs> if anybody's ever seen anything happen that way. <laughs> no, no. But my point is this. That speech he gave in 2004, that speech that made him famous, you know, when no red states, no blue states, this is United States, that whole speech, that is an immigrant speech. Yes. It is an immigrant speech delivered by a black man, but he's talking about, you know, his grandfather fighting in Patton's army. And he's it's an immigrant speech. He's talking about his mother's lineage. Yes. 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 His yes. father was a foreign student studying in America from Africa. Obama spent one month with the man. Yeah. He's talking about his mother's family's experience. That's his lineage. Yes. If his wife, Michelle Obama, were to have given that speech, it would have been a speech from the perspective of the descendants of slaves. It would have been a very, very different speech. The point is, we are in this country. We are not immigrants, but it is a place that defines itself as a nation of immigrants Followed by something you said earlier, a nation of laws. Yes. You know, it's it's very interesting, too, because when you go back and look at the history, you know, there has been this evolution of Pan-African concepts, right, about us going back to Africa. And we built America. And we became the problem of America because we were being brought over as chattel and our numbers were getting high and we became the biggest commodity in America. Billions of dollars. We were worth billions of dollars as chattel. And when they said, all right, we can't have them shipped here anymore. They started to really recognize the concept of us being a problem. And there was a point, or let me rephrase, there's been many points with Abraham, with, uh, oh my God, how am I forgetting his name? The other, uh, Thomas Jefferson, Mm -hmm. uh, where they were trying to figure out what to do. They wanted to establish a land for Africans to go to Africans referring to us blacks here. We were never accepted here and people don't understand the continuity between that concept coming from the leaders and now. So to, to move on to something else, you know, we've had many divisions within the ranks of black leadership, more specifically the condemnation of certain terms and slogans our people have used throughout the years for empowerment. Can you talk to me about why certain leaders like Martin Luther King felt adverse to the use of terms like black power? And also, I want you to apply this to the musical movement with James Brown and I'm black and I'm proud and all that. 
What are the two sides here? I mean, you know, um, I'm constantly saying that black people are not monolithic. Um, I mean, you know, there's no one way to define a black person. There's no two ways to define a black person. Um, I mean, you know, you and I could sit here and talk about a whole range of black people, none of whom are the same. Mm -hmm. They happen to be black, but, you know, we often get pigeonholed. So it's like, this is, you know, the black thing. Um, But we have individuals. And so you have to look at a person's background, you know, where they're from, uh, what type of environment they grew up in, et cetera. So let's look at it. Martin Luther King is the son of a very famous, uh, powerful black minister in Atlanta. Um, He's a Southern guy. And so his ideas, his attitudes, his belief are informed by the South. Malcolm X, you know, Omaha, Nebraska, Lansing, Michigan, Boston, New York. You know, Dr. King went and got his Ph.D. in Boston, but he went back to Georgia. And so at that time, what Martin Luther King represented was a educated black person from the South and his methods were conceived of based on that experience. What he wanted to do was to draw people from outside the South who would see the treatment black people were receiving in that space, be appalled by it, and then he could win the moral argument. And from that, he could go about trying to make change. So part of this was, it gets reduced to this, but this is a big part of it, turn the other cheek, which is, of course, religious. And the South has always been very religious. Um, black church services in the South, you know, always uh, assumed a big role in influencing the culture. And so here you have this guy saying, basically, let these people beat your ass. Mm -hmm. Let's film it. Show it to the rest of the country. Show it to the rest of the world. They'll see what we're dealing with. And we'll win that argument. That's one approach. But if you're somebody who's not from the South, you're from, you know, my hometown, Detroit, Chicago, New York, Philly, um, L.A., Bay Area, you, you grew up someplace else. And you, you trace your roots back to the South, but your family somewhere along the line left the South, went someplace else. You don't subscribe to that same mindset, that same ideology. Um, and so you're not going to be comfortable saying, whoop my ass and I'm going to take it so I could make a larger point your inclination is going to be put your hands on me, knuck if you buck, so to speak. Mm -hmm. So when you look at Malcolm, this is where Malcolm was coming from, and this is who Malcolm was speaking to, people who were ready to knuck if you buck. Mm -hmm. Now, with that, that Southern movement, and, and no disrespect, it's just it doesn't appeal to everybody, and it doesn't work for everybody. But that was rooted in the church. It was rooted in Christianity. The culture was largely religious culture, gospel music. But as people moved into these other parts of the country, they were still vibing off the same thing, but they were creating around the circumstances that inspired them in these new locations. So your groove, let's say, if you're in Georgia, is going to sound different than your groove if you're in Detroit or your groove if you're in Chicago or your groove if you in the Bay Area, right? It's, it's, that's the beauty of the culture. At some point, it all came together. And these things all kind of connect. But James Brown, a Southern guy, James Brown is from, you know, South Carolina um, by, by, by uh, way of Georgia. I mean, I love James. But James was, you know, as country as they come. Mm-hmm. 
in the best of all possible ways. But James was bringing you that that southern route. Now you get to Detroit and you get to Motown, it sounds different. You get to Philly and you got Philly International, it sounds different. You get to LA later on and you got, you know, Sound of Los Angeles Records, Solar Records, it sounds different. Cannonball Adderley used to say, you know, black music, it's all the same but it's responding to different circumstances, different challenges, different conditions. And so it comes out in the same way that if you know a guy from down South versus somebody from someplace else, they might be cool with each other, but their swag is different. Right. You know, you know? it's interesting because I always say that black music is an examination of black and white culture. You know, you right. get, it's, it's, it's a real microscope on the relationship and and with Martin Luther King and these peaceful protests versus the Malcolms with the uh the you know this new form of black empowerment i always kind of look at this as the old guard facing the new guard in a new time and with music Music has always served as a beacon for the black community from jazz or blues to jazz to soul to hip hop, right? So when you have James Brown saying I'm black and I'm proud, when you have black radio stations that didn't even want to play it, you know, and 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 he's embracing this new youthful spirit versus before that with the impressions, right? Right. You know what I'm saying? Choice of colors. Exactly. Which one would you choose, my brother? You, choose my brother. you know what I'm saying? So, yeah. so now we're entering a new movement. And then we know that hip hop is a pre college of all forms of music, more specifically something very germane to, to our soul, black soul. And then, you know, throughout the years, we're getting all the way up to fuck the police and we are where we are now. My, my whole thing is, I love the fact that you said that there is not a singularity as far as the black voice. You know, I feel like the black psyche is something, it's a world in and of itself, but it's really based on the fact that we are all trying to survive and we are all trying to be seen as equal, you know? So taking that concept and applying it to athletes, can you speak about the role of black, that black athletes have played in destroying and or reaffirming the negative stereotypes that promulgated that are promulgated by white America? Well, you know, this is what I was getting at earlier when I talked about the culture. I mean, and I talked about how black culture and its role in America is actually bigger than the black percentage of the population. Because when you talk about music, when you talk about sports, those two things especially, I mean, can you have that conversation without talking about the role that black people have played? Um, you, you can't. You can't. Like, you, you can't do it. No. Um, in those areas, we are, we're the standard, okay? Um, if you talk about the NBA, I mean, the logo is Jerry West. But that's from a long time ago. Right. When you compare players in the NBA, you don't compare them to Jerry West. No disrespect. Right. Jerry West was a great player. Yeah. But you don't compare players to him. He's not the standard. He's not the legacy. He's not Bill Russell, Wilt Chamberlain, Julia Serving, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, Michael Jordan, LeBron James. That's the standard. Right. If you talk about the NFL, the quarterback position obviously has been politicized and racialized. But outside of that, when you talk about the great running backs, you talk about the great wide receivers, the great defensive players. There's some great white dudes, but they're more great black dudes. That's the standard. That's who you're comparing it to. Black people don't even really play baseball no more. <laughs> but if you get into that conversation, you're talking about the Hank Aarons, the Willie Mays, and I know they hate him, even the Barry Bonds, right? 
track and field. I, I can keep going. Yeah. Like, um, we are the standard in those areas. When you talk about music, we're the standard. Well, you know, it's interesting when you refer to the standard, uh, you know, sports has served as a way for us to live with an equal playing field, right? Like it, 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 it was the way for us to show that, yo, we are equal. You know, if you even go back to the Olympics, right? In the thirties, right? You know what I'm talking about when we went to Germany. With Jesse Owens. Exactly. Right. You know, it's, it's, it's a time to show that, hey, we are I would, I would actually, I would actually say what sports has done is given us the opportunity to say we are better. I love Not that. equal. Yeah. Because if we were equal in this context, it wouldn't matter. Right. You got to be better. Okay. So then, <laughs> if, okay. If we were not, we, we have to be excellent. Okay. We can't be good. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Yes. If we, you, you, <laughs> right. Black and you're good, right. you get forgotten. Right. Right. You have to be excellent. Yes. Yes. So, you know, there's the age old adage that clothes makes the man, you know. So it's, it's interesting. We all remember. You know, when Iverson was rocking the big T-shirts and all that stuff, and it was like, yo, y'all can't dress like this anymore. Right. We all remember when Tyson got that big tattoo on his face and everybody was tripping. Right, right. We all remember a time before athletes had no tattoos, really. You know? Right. Um, when athletes wore gold chains. You know, all of this is a public performance of our culture. And there have been inhibitors. There have been restrictions on our expression. To you, why have these inhibitors been in place, been put in place? Well, you know, again, it goes back to who writes the rules. Right. So if you go back to the 60s, um, there's a handful of black athletes in sports, college or professional, right? Um, starts to change in the 60s, but still, 70s, 80s, where we are now, I mean, I have the, this is the benefit of, of age, right? When I first started watching sports back in the early 70s, the NBA was 50-50 black and white, you know? Um, it's hard for people to, to process that. Now, when I say white, I don't mean, you know, Slovenia and Croatia <laughs> and, you know, Russia, I mean, yeah. Alabama and, mm. you know, Wyoming yeah. and Georgia, yeah. like white people yeah. from America. Yeah. Um, I mean, I've seen the NBA go from being 50, 50 to being overwhelmingly black NFL. I've seen that transform, Right. So for a long time, what you had were people saying, we're going to let some of you in, but we're going to control you. And the smaller the number, the more control you have. Well, once you get in and you are excellent, now you have some room to negotiate a little bit. More and more people come in. And it was always controversial what you wear. I mean, I remember when Jordan had, you know, gold chain on. Before, you know, the big suits and all that, you know, image we got in the 90s, um, you know, Jordan's, you know, got an earring and got a necklace on. He's wearing the Air Jordan gear at the All-Star game. The first year he went and veterans were upset and these veterans weren't white. They were black. You know, it's like, dude, you're doing too much. <laughs> Um, and I mean, I get it. You know, the OGs want to respect. You don't just come in here and, you know, do what you want to do. We've been here before you got here. I have some respect for that. Yeah. And then, you know, the next thing you know, Jordan is the standard and he's wearing suits and ties and AI and those guys come along and they're doing the whole hip hop thing, the super baggy look. And so, you know, you can go from being Michael Jordan with a gold chain on your neck playing in like, you know, Air Jordan gear the Air Jordans are banned. <laughs> right. He was cutting edge at that point in the mid 80s. Right. Well, by the mid 90s, he's the establishment. And you got a younger generation of guys coming in 
who they're braiding their hair, they're changing their dress code up. Um, you know, I mean, that's what happens. I mean, you know what I'm saying? No. The, as you live, as you grow, um, it's hard because, you know, it's one thing when you're the young person and you come in the room and you're ready to tear some shit up. Right. And then later on in life, you're older and you got a group of young people who come in and they want to tear shit up. Right. And you're like, no, 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 no. <laughs> Y'all ain't coming in here tearing my shit up. Like, right, 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 right. <laughs> it challenges you as an individual. Yeah. Um, but it's also, I think, the evolution of time and how different generations approach circumstances differently and they look differently. Absolutely. They look different. Back in the 90s, I mean, I remember, you remember this, NBA players were clean. This is the era of the double-breasted suit. Um, clean. clean. And then the hip-hop thing came along and if you had on a suit, you were a square. Right. And now where are we? We gone beyond the suits, mm -hmm. but NBA players are now still uh, are seen now as trendsetters, yes. you know, as as fashion icons with a whole different look. So it goes, it goes in cycle. Well, it's just, it's interesting because it's a cyclical uh, cyclical issue, right? You know, I mean, think about Miles Davis in suits. Right. Think about his change. Think about Curtis Mayfield in suits. Think about his change, right, right in the '70s, because it's you know the suit. What we define as the suit, the Western suit, represents whiteness to many people. So a lot of blacks, late 60s, early 70s, like, yo, take out the fro, going back to our African gear, you know, like, this is us. And that 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 is analogous to the hip hop nation. But what I what I can say, you know, we could all refer to this as like a sartorial finesse that is unapologetically black. And it's really just a statement. I always say that what you wear is a public performance and it's your choice. But whatever you're, you know, you're always saying something. You're always making a statement, you know? Right. So, uh, right. so yo, bro, thank you for your time, man. I, I could sit and talk to you for hours. <laughs> hours. Yes, hours, you yes. know? And we will continue this. This is Dr. Todd Boyd, and you are tuned in to Invisible Blackness. <laughs>